So for those of you who know me, weeping is not a surprise. It is the way I react to virtually everything. Um, <laughs> but I realize I do, that does sort of uh, shatter the image I have among some people who, uh, who like to describe me as tough, unyielding, ideological, and so I say guilty as charged, but uh, you know, there's a part of me that's not like that. So, so first of all, let me thank you so much for this award. Um, I'm obviously very honored and very humbled by it. Um, first, of course, because of who it's named for. Um, oh my God. Professor Mar Frankel has been the gold standard for those of us who care about fiduciary issues. Um, she's guided, she's inspired us. Um, although diminutive in stature, although I noticed I'm about the same height as you, so maybe I should use that. Um, she stands head and shoulders above all of us in this world who care about fiduciary principles. So receiving an award named for her, it's wonderful. So, um, and I certainly want to thank Dallas for speaking on behalf of my old friend, Bob Monks. I know this award was not very old, and I, I have the privilege of knowing all three of the prior recipients, and they too um, make me honored and humbled to be in their, in their uh, company. So, people ask me all the time, why did I take on this challenge? There are all sorts of speculation you know, did I, was I burned by some terrible investment advisor? <laughs> did I lose all my money? Did relatives and friends lose all their money? And the answer is, of course, that's a wonderful, wonderful story, but it's actually not a motivating factor. Although I will say, as someone over the years who has relied on relatives and friends to give me financial advice that turned out to be awful. Uh, there is an element of the personal in this. Um, but that really wasn't the reason that I started on this project. I started on it because immediately after I was confirmed, um, we had a staff meeting. We have an executive staff meeting. Tim had to cancel it today because we were all here. Um, a meeting daily of the office directors, and I gave them an assignment. You know, in my first life, I was a high school English teacher, so I just can't resist giving people assignments. And I gave them an assignment, and the assignment was the following. Assume for the sake of argument that you, not me, had been just confirmed by the Senate. So now you're the Assistant Secretary. What are the two or three things that you would want us to take on as projects over the next four years? Because I only thought we had four years. Um, and interestingly enough, virtually everybody that came to that staff meeting the next day flagged this as something that we needed to do. That we needed to do some work on the definition of fiduciary. And they told me about the cases that our field people had been working on where uh, it took them so much time and effort to try to establish the fact that the people were fiduciaries. We had small business owners, we had employees, we had all sorts of people who relied on the advice they were given to their detriment. And when we tried to hold those people accountable, they hid behind the five-part test. Now, as an aside, when the five-part part test first came out in 1975, I thought it was, let's see, I was going to say stupid, but um, I, I just didn't understand the legal basis for it. It didn't seem like something that was grounded in the statute because it was so divergent from the statute. And I remember having my friends at the Department of Labor, of course I was just out of law school myself, and I remember having my friends at the Department of Labor tell me that they needed to do it to calm the, the 
the fears of the financial services industry that given the, giving the kind of professional advice they would be giving to plan fiduciaries, um, they wanted to know that they weren't going to be sued uh, because the advice turned out not to be, the, uh, the, the result turned out not to be as uh, positive as they thought it was. And the courts actually have taken that as their, as you all know, has ta have taken on a, um, not a retrospective view, but a what did you know at the time that you made the decision and how are you following prudent rules at the time and procedures at the time. Um, last night at dinner, when Dallas was talking about the ESA part of it, I had no idea myself that that was even part of it, but it, it doesn't surprise me that the people who advise ESOPs, even back then, were very interested in making sure that uh, their advice was not subject to strict fiduciary rules, and we still have problems in the valuation context with, with uh, ESOPs today. So having had the best advice of my longtime career staff, I decided to move forward on it. It was something that I thought needed to be done, and honestly, the two reasons I decided to go forward was it was the right thing to do, and I thought it was something that we could do that was within our purview. Now, Alan at the time, and I'm sure others at that meeting thought I was crazy, um, Alan did ask me whether I really fully understood the <laughs> opposition that we would have from the financial services industry, and of course, I said yes, because I worked on Capitol Hill for 16 years, and I watched as lawmaker after lawmaker tried to make changes in the regulation of financial services, whether it was the insurance industry, the mutual funds, the banks, whatever, and I saw them not be overly successful in doing that. So I think I, at some level, did understand the level of opposition we were going to get, um, but I certainly can say that there were moments in which I thought, I never, I never thought we'd lose. I did think that we wouldn't be able to put out as strong a rule as we did. And I think that is part of the tribute that I need to pay to some other people. I know I was told that I shouldn't thank the staff, but, but I never bothered to listen to anybody anyway. So I, of course, am going to uh, thank the staff. And I'm actually going to talk about a couple of heroes that I have. Um, First of all, I had wonderful deputy assistant secretaries. The hardest day, I think, in my career at the Department of Labor is when I had to go to Tricia Smith and tell her that I was poaching her top ERISA lawyer, Tim Hauser, to come and be my deputy. Um, it was not a pretty conversation, but it was the right thing to do, and I'm grateful to Tim. Um, I had two political deputies. First, Michael Davis, and I was reminded of the advice that Michael gave me when Barb was talking, and, and uh, some, of the, some of the others on the panel were talking, because Michael used to say to me, the one thing you need to know is people do what you pay them to do. And if you pay people to sell this product, whether it's a good product, a bad product, they're going to do it, because people do what you pay them to do. And, you know, I didn't have much management experience when I came to the Department of Labor, and it was the thing I thought was my biggest vulnerability. I didn't have any management experience. And Michael used to say to me when I would, I would lament the fact that I didn't ever know whether I was doing the right thing in terms of management, and he would be like, well, you, you listen to people, and that's the most important part of management experience. But Michael was a very sage person, and this people do what you pay them to do was something that I never lost sight of. So Michael was with me when we started this process. Um, and then Judy Maris, my, Michael's successor, um, stuck around, sticks, is still with us, adding value to moving the process along. Um, Judy had the kind of special uh, investment experience that I don't have. I could be, I could and I am strongly passionate about a lot of things, but that doesn't mean that I always know 
exactly, I don't always have the experience. And one of the things I've tried to do and one of the things I'm so grateful for is that I've been able to call upon my tremendously experienced and smart uh, staff. And Judy added such value to the process. Um, one of the things that used to irritate me when the press would report the industry <laughs> comments. You know, the industry would say, that, and they're still saying if you, if you read the lawsuits, the industry would talk about how the people at the Department of Labor really were basically uninformed. We didn't get it. We didn't understand. There was no ex expertise. We had to look to the SEC for expertise. Well, one of the heroes of this process is our current Labor Secretary, Tom Perez. And what Secretary Perez told us to do was absolutely essential to the process. And he was absolutely essential to the process. He said, build a big table, invite everybody to the table, listen with interest and humility. And that's what we did. And so even in times when the industry wasn't particularly willing to be helpful to us, I always, and I've said this publicly before, I always learn so much from the meetings that we had with the industry and their comment letters. I'm not sure that they intended for us <laughs> to get the kind of information we got, but it was very, very useful. And what we did was, led by Tim and my career team, what we did was to sort through the information we got. Because there was always in every comment letter, in every meeting, as much as uh, there was a lot of bluster, there was always at least one nugget of good, useful information. And I understood, although it took me a while to understand what Tom Perez was talking about, about humility. You know, I, I wasn't quite sure what he meant at the beginning. But I think our rule represents humility. Because lots of times in my career, I've started out with an idea that I thought I was absolutely right on. And you're never absolutely right. And to be able to say that at the end of the process, we listened, we learned, and we acted on the information we got. We sorted through the information that we got from the industry, from all of, of, all of our advocates as well, and we sifted through that process and took the information that we needed to build a bigger, stronger rule and sort of ignored the rest of it. Um, but the process, the open process, there wasn't a meeting we turned down as much as uh, I will be willing to admit at times I was like, oh, do we have to meet with these people again? Um, I must say I felt in many instances part of Groundhog Day, the movie. It was like Groundhog Day, DOL version. Um, but every one of those meetings we took uh, was, a, was of value. And the meetings that we're taking today to talk about compliance assistance and try to help people in the industry to move forward in compliance are also very useful. And several of you said it on the panel, and I want to really thank all of you because I found everything that you said to be illuminating and in some cases embarrassing. I don't really like to hear people say good things about me. Um, but it was uh, a very wonderful process and it was a very useful process. And it is remarkable, I, remark I find it remarkable myself that we were able to strengthen the rule. And that is a tribute to the, the ingenuity, intelligence, committedness of our career staff, and also to the political leadership. There are a lot of people in this room uh, who aren't part of the EPSA staff, which are part of the EPSA family. We have our representative from our Congressional Affairs Office, and happy birthday, Jenny. I understand it's your birthday today. Um, we have Mike Trupo and Jason Serby, who come to us from our press office. Um, we had our policy office um, involved in it. You know, there were times where I thought, do we really have to have all these people? But I'm always accused of the Department of Labor of um, considering too many people on my team. <laughs> because, as I've said to many of the reporters who have asked me, this is a project that it didn't just take a village, it took two villages. And uh, 
I'm sure I'm, uh, oh, and the people in the front office, Ali is not here, Ali Power, who started as my chief of staff, who now works for the secretary. Um, I'm not going to pretend this is the Academy Awards where I'm going to recognize everybody. Um, but I really want to say, I want to talk a little bit about my family because people ask me, you know, why do I have this drive and this passion, this commitment, and it's really all about the family. Um, my parents, I, I come from a, um, I, I always considered it to be a big extended Italian family, and um, I know there are bigger families that are family, but um, my parents had a strong sense of justice and they um, encouraged all of us um, to think about, you know, I, I didn't come from a wealthy family. My father was a blue collar worker. My mother um, spent most of her years in the uh, non-paid volunteer workforce, except for that period in World War II when she was an airplane, airplane mechanic. I used to call her sometimes Rosie the Riveter because that's the kind of stuff she did in World War II. But, um, I know I was a source of frustration to my parents all the time <laughs> because I'd always be butting into other people's business. I'm really terrible about advocating for myself, but if there's some, if I think you've been slighted or I think there's something that you've been victimized for, I'm going to be there fighting for you with all the uh, passion that I can. My parents used to call me, and some of you may be familiar with this technical term, a Badinsky. <laughs> Anybody ever heard that term before? And my grandmother used to say, someday you're going to get in a lot of trouble for sticking your nose in other people's business. Um, and so, but this was a terrible, actually I thought it was a positive, but I don't know that my parents necessarily thought it was. But um, one day my father sat down, sat me down and gave me the talk. Now, it's probably not the talk that you're thinking about. <laughs> this was, um, he shared with me some sage advice that he got from his commanding officer in World War II. And many of you have heard this story before, but, I'll, but for those of you who haven't, I'll repeat it. So he sat me down and he said, look, my commanding officer, uh, the people in my company were all young, they were mostly enthusiastic, it was the draft, so you know, it wasn't like today where people have to volunteer to be in the military. And he said, the commanding officer said, you know, when you're in war, you have to fight every fight. You have to climb every hill. You have to defend every location. But in your life, you can pick the hill that you want to die on. And that was his advice to me to get me to tone down my <laughs> Budinsky <laughs> has, uh, tendencies. Um, he only partially succeeded, um, but it has certainly been the driving principle that I've had in my adult life. When I worked on Capitol Hill, there were lots of projects that I worked on. There were lots of bills that I worked on. And um, I had some wins and I had some losses. Uh, but I always think that the, the, the issues that I decided to pursue were things that were important. Um, Sometimes my siblings didn't learn that lesson from my dad, but I did. And so that day, when everybody was telling me this was a very important thing for us to do, and Alan said to me, are you really sure you want to take this on? I decided this was a hill I chose to die on. Uh, hopefully I didn't die. <laughs> uh, it's never going to be over. We know it never ends. Um, but I hope we've taken the first steps in this rule um, to change to change the world, to change the culture. Because the most important thing is to make sure that if we have tools at our disposal to make things better for other people, that we employ those tools and that we develop new tools. I have no way to thank my staff. People give me thank credit for this. It's not me. So maybe I was the front person for the band, but, uh, but if people weren't playing behind me, there would be no music. Who knows what my next foray into public life may or may not be, where, where I may go after this. Um, but I will tell you this, 
that wherever I go and how, however long I live, I'll keep fighting. Thank you.